Thanks, Mary. So, um, so far, have you heard of enough genotoxicity? And uh, my talk is going to focus on genotoxicity biomarkers, the uh, revolution and the application in molecular epidemiology. So, also, the achievement of our society and our members have been made in the past, in the current, and the, the future. So here is the approach I'm going to take. This is the three steps. <clears throat> the, terms, the term of molecular epidemiology was first used in Dr. Uh, Kimber's uh, paper in 1973. 20 years after, the famous book, and I'm showing here, uh, by two uh, um, published and edited by two influential scientists, and then you're going to meet uh, Professor uh, uh, Fred Frederick uh, and tomorrow morning, and she's going to be a keynote speaker. So, see the book published, and then the field of molecular epi is, is really modernized and bloomed during the last 25 years. <coughs> the beauty of the molecular is really to put cutting edge biology into the traditional epidemiology. So, how what's the difference? The traditional epi is the only focus study the association of exposure and the, the disease. And the molecular epi is really trying to understand what's going through this black box and really trying to unlock this black box by using the tools called the biomarkers. There are three types of biomarkers of exposure, susceptibility, and the early effect. The genotoxicity is the most important biomarker in, of the early effects. On the casual pathway to the, develop the disease. And the genotoxicity is also um, key characteristic of almost the all type of carcinogen. If you want to learn more about the key characteristics, I recommend you to go to this EHP paper. And the project is led by um, Dr. Martin Smith from Berkeley, and they collaborated with many uh, our members, may sitting in this um, uh, Artists from the artists here too. And most recently, EHP also published two more uh, key uh, KC uh, papers on male and female reproductive agents. So that's very recently published. So let's get back to genotoxicity. And I'm using the same example as clouded benzene parent, exposure to benzene parent, and again, Binding to the DNA and the form of the DNA atoms, and I'm showing up here. <clears throat> so, in general, the biomarkers of genotoxicity can basically divide to three groups the damage in the DNA, or the alterations at the chromosome levels, and the more present and recently, the biomarkers have really revolutionized by the detection with the omic or chip related assays. So this is what I'm going to give you a few examples uh, from uh, biomarkers of genotoxicity. First, the DNA adapt analysis historically was detected by HPLC or post labeling. And the nowadays for the specific DNA adapts, most likely, you can use the antibody-based immunoassay, like sandwich assays, or more, <coughs> most recently, more accurately trying to detect the DNA adapts by using mass-based uh, uh, analysis, okay, like a adaptomics, you know, by um, Steve Rockport from Berkeley or Jim Swan at the UNC. So here is the DNA-based damage. How about the chromosome level? 
The conventional psychogenetics showed here bending or non-bending can be a very useful tool because it's a very you can uh, apply to the human study uh, readily. And also, I really like to specify here the chromosome operation was the first or maybe uh, the only biomarkers can predict cancer in the future. So that's a study led by uh, Stefano Bonassi and his core, uh, core uh, his colleagues applied in this uh, Italian core and quickly walking through why chromosome operation can predict the, the cancer. So late 60s and 70s, they proved about 15,000 subjects and uh, join their blood, catch the cells, and make the metaphysic spreads and stored. 20 years later, they, they form in their, this uh, population and then see who died with their life and, uh, and, and then they went to look at the uh, sample they collected 20 years before. So what do they have shown? If you have a higher chromosome operation rate 20 years earlier, and then your cancer risk is doubled. And the risk for blood cancer in the, uh, the cancer in the blood forming system like leukemia and lymphoma would be triggered. So, so that's, that's why we said that this is, is a confirmed biomarker to predict the cancer. In addition, at the cytogenetic level, there's another assay called magnucleic. And I think everybody here is pretty familiar with it. And I also think magnucleic is somehow our EMGS um, assay. So uh, adapted from the plant studies to mammal and a human study with a group of scientists in Toronto, Canada. And I start with gene sustaining. You can see the mi micronuclei and gene sustaining. You, do, you don't know what is in this micronucleus. So the later, using kinetical scan, uh, staining, and you can tell, oh, the, micro, the micronuclei could be a whole chromosome because they contact the uh, kinetical. So the resolution of the uh, micronuclei say, keep just going, uh, the merge with fish and the development of the micronuclei by the flow. So Dr. Uh, Hayashi is the one really contributed to the development of uh, um, detecting my micronuclei by flow and it is also a recipient of our EMGS uh, Hanada uh, award in, 90, uh, in 2007. So when we mention the uh, micronuclear uh, study, I have to mention this a human micronucleus. This is a global project. You can see it led by our um, EMGS member and uh, show all the familiar faces here. And it's a very productive team. And so far they have published new, new mark, numerous of the papers up here. I'm just going to show a few. So this group not only trying to set up the standards how to identify and score the micronucleus, they also lay out the all possible pathways or mechanisms how the micronuclear formed. So this is a very exciting group and I heard they want they, they are still generated more and more papers in here. Um, as I mentioned, micronuclei merged with fish. So what is fish? The, the fish technology really start uh, blooming up after human genome genetic code. And, and here is an example. Two scientists, Dr. Pinko and Gray from UCSF, was the inventor of this technology and the University of California actually on the Patent. So the fish technology can not only apply to the macrophage or to the uh, blood samples, and then, and also the fish you can you know use for the uh, interface cells, not only in the blood and in the buccal cells or nasal cells. 
they can also apply it to the sperm cell. I'm going to show you an example. The interface fish applied to the study leading by brain diabetes and assay from Berkeley. And you also uh, see the uh, Francesco and Dr. G, our previous poster, not the BMS. And uh, our past uh, president, Andy, all, you know, leading and joining this uh, project. So we studied the chromosome aneuploidy in Basing in the sperm and the blood of Chinese male workers exposed to the bending. So the, this is a paper published in, M, in EMM to a comparison of the aneuploidy of chromosome 21X and the Y, you know, compare them in the blood and in the sperm. So now we move. So this is the only a few different types of the chromosomes you would ask. Do you have a technology you can um, analyze all type of chromosomes <coughs> at the one time? Yes, the sky or other fish is the way to go. So, quick example: apply the up, upper chrom fish. So we call that chrom chromosomics or sievers. Apply this technology in bending in the uh, blood cells of benzene exposed to workers and also recently also applied to um, the stem progenitor cells of formata exposed to workers in China. So the loss of the chromosome or the gain of the chromosome. So the term of CWAS actually borrowed from the GWAS, the genomic wide association study. So C was at the chromosome level and the G, G was at the DNA level. When molecular biologists or geneticists meet with epidemiologists, so the power is really booming. So geneticists can offer epidemiologists a much better tool to study um, genomic-wide uh, spectrum and uh, or epidemiologists um, can help genetics design a better human studies. So the you can see you know from the GWAS study all different you know um, association of the SNP uh, created with different type of the disease. Besides the GWAS, there are also many other <coughs> array microarray-based analysis, like the <coughs> here I show the gene expression, or the CCH-based um, um, high-throughput technology to detect the copy number, so the NCV, the copy number variations. So now, you know, you don't, we don't have to only rely on the microscope-based analysis. <coughs> And most recently, the next generation sequence has been <coughs> applied to the human studies as well. But you can see, step by step, now we're collecting more and more data. And also the assay is getting fancier and fancier, but also more expensive. How can we apply all this to the human study? And it's going to be very costly. So now, I'm to last of the CRISPR, and this TGXDDI um, new um, methods have been developed. So a couple of years ago, this group was published this, uh, this DNA <coughs> damaging inducer trying to um, see if we could using a in vitro system to, to predict the, the genotoxicity um, agents uh, in the human. So if you have any question, you can ask uh, Carol, and who is the uh, co-author of this paper. Um, and uh, for the CRISPR, and uh, Chris Wolpe is going to give a talk, so make sure you should go to that section. Without further delay, here is, I want to look at the summary and the, our bright future. So many genotoxicity biomarkers have been applied in human studies at the both DNA and the chromosome levels. 
and the, from the historical methods to most of the current, and the, from the single essays to more high throughput and array of omega based analysis, like TVAS to CVAS to next generation of sequence. And what do we get so far? We collect enormous of data. Now we have all this data. We learned one by one. But the key question is how can we digest all this data together? And what can we learn from them? So that's our future, what we should do, is by using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Every time if I say that, I get a question, how, how you can do it? Can we really do it? So the good news is most recently, the Berkeley Super Fund Center has received a uh, supplement fund and also some funding from Cal EPA or EHA to create a center for data management and a collaboration. So we are trying to target on this next step in the near future. Can we really get there? So this is still some thoughts, but I want to assure you, I'm just going to show you this. Only in, in collaboration with you know, NCI or collaborating with NCI, the NCI in China, sorry, sorry. So what we have already conducted, multiple studies, uh, human studies, to uh, chemical exposure to benzene, formaldehyde, TCE, arsenic, P PHA, and so on. Then the data we have been uh, uh, collected from GWAS, CWAS, you know, all the uh, all mix. So now, but the data is all pieces, it's all in the different places. So we need to collect them together and build an accessible data, data set. Then try to use the machine learning approach to the deep learning. Let's make it happen. During the next 50 years, and I don't know you, I won't be last to put the next 50 years, but I'm happy to join the right at least at the beginning. To the last, I'd like to thank all my co-authors, uh, my collaborators at UC Berkeley, NCI, China, and the most important, our EMGS society. Thank you. <laughs>